Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Crisco and Magna and members of the committee. Um, thank you for having me here today. My, my testimony is not in front of you. I will get you written testimony. At, um, it's been a busy day, so I have it written out for myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm here in support of House Bill 6656 uh, to require um, gun owners to have insurance. I think that uh, we have pretty good evidence from automobiles that insurance companies are very good at evaluating risk factors and putting a price on items such as a gun or a car. Um, I don't know how many of you, I think a number of you were in Newtown with us when we heard uh, a father get up who said he had absolutely no agenda, that all he would ask is that we treat the deadly force of a gun like we treat the deadly force of a car, that there are a lot of law-abiding car drivers who pay insurance because the car has some implied risk. And this bill looks to do the same thing uh, that that father asked for, which is um, a sign of value uh, to the um, right to have a gun, and nobody's questioning that right to have a gun. Um, so I think that there are community risks affiliated with having a gun, just like there are uh, community risks affiliated with driving a car, which can be a deadly vehicle. I think the reason that this comes up in part is because in 1996, uh, in an appropriations bill, the CDC's funding to do research about guns was cut significantly, actually all of it that had been assigned to that. And there was a stipulation in that amendment that stripped the funding that said none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the CDC may be used to promote or advocate gun control. And that really had a chilling effect. So we've been without data. So having insurance companies look at the risk actually helps us get, could help us get the data and let the markets tell us what the hazards are. It's a very uh, conservative principle, let the markets dictate what the price is and what the hazards are of that gun. This is really, um, I'll just close by saying, um, this is really bigger than Newtown. This is about children dying every day. Actually, since the 113th Congress has convened 3,754 children have been shot in the United States. I read uh, a statistics that, that in 2010, a child under five was more likely to be killed by a gun than was a police officer shot to be shot in the line of duty. The guns are out there, there's hazards affiliated with them, and I think insurance would help us quantify what those risks are, uh, since there are many things in the way of uh, looking at the risks in our federal legislation. Thank you for your attention. Perfect timing, too. The buzzer just went off. For an elected official, uh, I congratulate you. Uh, Representative Sampson. Thank you, Representative, for uh, your testimony this morning. Uh, just a, a, a very simple question, really. I, I don't agree with your correlation to an automobile, first and foremost, but rather than get into that, I really just want to ask the question that has to do with Section 2 of the bill, or I'm sorry, Section 1-2, which requires the self-defense insurance. I think that no one would say that we would require somebody to have self-defense insurance for their use of an automobile, because I don't know that people do use that. Um, and I just, to me, that, that is one of the most um, egregious parts of this bill is that we're going to require people to have insurance for their actions in self-defense. And I just wondered if you speak to that using well, I, your I, right. equation. I think, it's a, I think it's a very fair comment. And what we did was we looked to how other states, um, what other states did. And, and, you know, this isn't all my bill. I worked with other, with other folks. Um, but I, I would say that I think you make a fair argument. And if the committee decided to strip that section, I, I would understand it. My big goal broad-based, you know, for the chairs to understand, is that we look seriously at requiring gun owners to have insurance because, and I know you disagree with the car analogy, but, you know, we, we know that cars cause deaths, and we know that they cause injury, and the idea that someone has to be responsible for those societal costs, the driver bears those costs, we all do. All of us sitting here drive a car and are required to have insurance. So that's my big goal with this bill. Uh, obviously, I'm going to um, 
let the committee use it, uh, its understanding of insurance laws. I'm more of an expert on education laws, but I think your point is a fair one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator, and forgive me for calling you representative. It's just force it's of fine. habit. You were a, a I former, was with you are a former representative That's and right. a current senator, and I apologize for that. No it was problem. not not intentional. Uh, and, and thank you for your testimony. Again, uh, I had a thought. I, it's, it's escaping me, and I'm trying to re, re grasp it right at this moment. Uh, but it has to do with uh, who's responsible. And again, I would just point out that an automobile and a gun are just tools. The car is not responsible for a death, nor is a gun. It is the person that is driving or holding the firearm that would be responsible for what happens. And, and if, uh, if I could just reply to that, I mean, sometimes, like my son was driving a car down a main street in our town, and the brakes went on him, and he hit the car in front of him. So it wasn't his fault, wasn't the person in front of him's fault, it was an accident. I know that guns can accidentally, you know, shoot. People can drop them and they can shoot and people get hurt. Understood. So and the, the idea is that that's what this does, is it covers for accidents like that that can happen and, and other events as well. Understood. And this is with my, uh, the reason for my first question really asking about the self-defense whether we're trying to get at a potential accident that could occur, uh, because certainly insurance companies are never going to cover intentional acts. And I don't know, it just seems to me that, uh, you know, some of the motivation behind this is to maybe connect it with the acts of a mass murder. And I don't think there's any correlation whatsoever. The acts of a mass murder would never be covered by insurance. I think that, that what happened in Newtown and then some of the awareness of what's happening um, in the suburbs, in many, I mean, many, many more, a lot of teens die mm -hmm. of suicide and adults too with guns in the suburbs and um, also a lot of innocent people die in our cities. Um, I think the idea of this bill is that Newtown raises the sense that there are people dying every day and being injured and there's a societal cost to gun ownership that's in the billions in emergency room visits and other things are our societal costs. And it struck me as an analogy to cars because it's, it's a very similar thing. There are societal costs to driving a car and it's a deadly weapon as well. Uh, uh, so that was, you know, that's the motivation for this is trying to make Connecticut safer and assigning having us as a culture look at what are the costs. And I believe that holding insurance on a gun, if you're at a higher risk, if an insurance company decides you're a higher risk, say you had, um, you had incidents of uh, some kind of a, abuse in your home or aggravated assault, you'd probably have to pay higher rates on gun insurance than if you had a perfectly clean record. So the idea is just trying to actu actuarially figure out what are the costs of gun ownership. And we know that people are dying, but there are other costs as well. So, I mean, do you have any of that data whatsoever? Because I think what the uh, evidence would show is that the societal, societal costs of uh, automobile ownership are much higher than legal gun ownership. And I well, think that this uh, bill is only going to apply to legally uh, uh, owned guns. I mean, criminals certainly are not going to do it, and they're responsible for all of the crime and deaths outside of the, the few accident, accidents that might occur with firearms with law-abiding citizens? Well, from, from my previous testimony at another committee, I can tell you that, and I know you had a caveat in the way you described it, but by 2015 in the United States, it's expected that gun deaths will surpass automobile deaths. And we know that since we've put a lot of safety measures in place with automobiles, that the number of deaths by automobile are going down. Well, but the fact is that the gun deaths you're in including are, I'm certain, uh, criminal gun deaths, suicides, and many other things that have very little to do with this requirement for insurance on people that are obeying the law. We would probably disagree, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Well, I'd be curious to know if there's any data that exists that might tell me otherwise, because I, I, I really don't believe. It. I mean, there's tons and tons of data out there about. Uh, uh, you know, our, our uh, violent crimes in the U.S. and uh, the statistics uh, before and after various weapon bans and so forth. Uh, and I think that usually the numbers I see that involve gun deaths include all these other things, criminal gun deaths, even police officers shooting criminals in the act of uh, saving another innocent person uh, would be included in that gun death. So how many gun deaths are actually, you know, it, it, you know would I, fall I in the category? I can try to find that. I can try to, I can I'd try like to, to know very find, much. find that 
out for, I can try to find that data for you. Thank you, Senator. And, and again, for me, I'm, I don't mean to. Uh, no, I, to, I appreciate this. I really, I really like the dialogue. I mean, to, to me, I find this proposal offensive on so many, so many levels. I understand your perspective. I want to appreciate and respect it. Uh, and, and treat it with the, the respect it deserves of any anybody who brings uh, legislation before us. Uh, the constitutional issue is a much bigger one for me. And I, just as a final question, what do you say to people that would say that uh, you don't have a constitutionally protected right to drive a car, but the Second Amendment in our own Constitution provides for that? Well, what I would say to you that um, I totally believe, and, and the Connecticut right to bear arms is even stronger than the U.S. right to bear arms. I'm, I'm not... I'm not questioning that. Uh, you have the right to fair to free speech, but you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. The idea is you have rights, but that there are limits on these rights when it comes to public health and public safety. And I think that's what this is trying to address. But I really appreciate your perspective too. And I think, like Thanks. most dialogues we've been having uh, through this right. challenging session, uh, it's been very respectful. Hey, the Supreme that. Court has already kind of gone through that whole philosophy about right, whether you can shout fire in a crowded theater or not. You can go out in the woods and shout fire. Just as you couldn't go into a movie theater and fire your gun, you could go out in the woods and fire it. And I think the limitations exist, and they're spelled out in various court cases that have happened in our Supreme Court when these issues have come up before. So I don't know, somehow it seems to me it's above our pay grade in the Connecticut General Assembly to be talking about constitutional law. But I'll leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Actually, maybe I could shed a little light on the self-defense piece. It's actually there to protect the gun owner in the event uh, their liability carrier, I believe, uh, denies coverage. So it's actually a protection for the, uh, for the gun owner because it wouldn't be negligence. It would have been an intentional act which they would die and I would, which they would most likely uh, put, put up their assets, their personal assets at risk. So I think that's thank the logic you. between. Uh, thank you, Representative Magna. <laughs> excuse me? Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, uh, any other questions? Oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank Senator. you.